Today we're going to be continuing in our study in the book of Daniel, and we're, the title of this is Daniel Thriving in Chaos. And the reason that's the title is that Daniel at 15 is uprooted from his homeland. He is taken almost a, a thousand miles or so away to Babylon. Everybody that, that he knows and he's familiar with, um, his family, his culture, it's, it's gone. He's now a prisoner of the Babylonians. His life has been turned upside down. We talked about that last week. We get to chapter 2 in Daniel and more chaos breaks out. Uh, Last week we discovered that Daniel and his three buddies, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, if you want to go with the Babylonian version, they they so excelled that they were promoted in their teens into the group of the wise men. So God was at work. Well, today we're going to go to chapter 2, and in chapter 2, the king has a dream. Anybody here ever had a bad dream before? You ate a little bit too much late night pizza? You know, the thing about dreams, especially in this day, is that people often thought that their future could be told by understanding their dreams. Now, why do we want our why do we want to know about our future? It's because you and I crave stability. We crave you know that that sense of being in control and being prepared. And if things are happening around us that are unpredictable and unexpected, we, we're not sure if we can be okay even today. It's like riding a bike down a country road. You go up and down the hills and valleys and around the curves, and you, you never know when the farmer and his wagon are going to be pulling out in front of you on the road. Uh, and who knows, maybe one of the cows broke loose and are, are coming across the road as well. I mean, and the thing is, that's what life feels like. You never know what's coming next, except for someone described really... Uh, This journey is like driving a bike on a country road with your eyes closed. Now that's freaky. That should make you panic. Did you know that Americans in 2019 spent $2.2 billion on psychic services trying to find out what's going to happen? Companies spend Don't do that, by the way. I'm just here to tell you. Read the Bible. It's not advised. Companies spend all kinds of money to try to future cast and predict the future. And I mean, because they need to know stuff. They don't know. But the future is a big deal to us. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to go to one of my favorite Chinese restaurants down, restaurant down here on Sunshine, and, you know, I usually go with James, my son, and we get our Chinese food, and what I like is they usually bring around the fortune cookies, and so, you know, I love to crack open the crispy kind of bland Chinese cookie, and it's got a little piece of paper inside it as your fortune. Now, I'm a good legalistic Baptist from the days past, so I pick out my fortune and I say out loud, God, I don't believe in this, but it's fun to read. And so let's read our fortunes. That's what I do. And early on when we started doing this, James would get his fortune cookie, crack it open, pull out the paper, but he needed me to read it for him. And so he would hand it to me and he would say, Dad, read. So I would get his fortune and, <laughs> you know, one of my gifts is annoying. My wife and son will attest to that. I get, the, I get the fortune, and I say, uh, oh, James, he says, eat more broccoli. And he goes, ah, oh, because he doesn't like broccoli. And it didn't really say that, and he knows it. So, I mean, after a few times of me cracking, he cracks open his fortune cookie, hands me the, the, the fortune, and I read, and it's always eat more broccoli. Who knew, you know? He got smart and he started handing his fortune to somebody else at the table and asked them to read it. But usually I got to them first and I've whispered, eat more broccoli. And they pick it up and they say, eat more broccoli. And he turns to me and he says, dad. I get the growl. I win every time, you know. It's... The 
the story that we have today is the story of a king that had a dream. And he's feeling like he's riding his bike up and down the country road, except for he's the king. His name is Nebuchadnezzar. He's one of the most powerful kings in the history of the world. He has wealth beyond description. He has power that is unmatched. So when he, does, when he rides, he rides not just with a little backpack, but the whole kingdom on his back. And he is freaking out because he feels like there's a message in the dream that he just had. And he needs to know what it means. And so that's where our story is in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to all the magicians and astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king and the king said to them, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Let your servants, uh, tell your servants the dream and we will give you the interpretation. Just want to give you a little side nerd note right here. Did you know that beginning in this verse and until chapter 7 of Daniel, uh, it is written not in Hebrew but in Aramaic. It's the only section of the Old Testament not written in Hebrew but in Aramaic. That doesn't matter to you probably, but anyway, it's kind of fun to know. Um, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision's firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. This is the classic carrot and the stick routine. Here's the carrot, you tell me what I need to know, I'm going to give you riches, honor, and it's, it's going to be a good day. You don't tell me, and I'm going to kill you. Now, that's the ultimate stick. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I, will, and, and I shall know that you can give this interpretation. The Chaldeans answered and answered the king and said, "There is not a man on earth who can tell the king the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrology, or astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh." For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now I'm telling you what, that's a disturbing dream, not only to the king, but to people around him. It's interesting to me how that the wise men surround him and say, king, let, let's, let me explain how this works. You know, this interpreting dreams, you tell us the dream first, we, we can interpret it. The king says, oh no, I'm much smarter than you guys. You know, you, you want to tell me your dream? I can, I can make something up for you. He says, I, I know that's how that works. So that I can be sure that what you're telling me is really something that is supernaturally given to you, I need you to tell me both. Have you ever had a disturbing dream that woke you up? Um, most of us dream, they say. Uh, I've had disturbing dreams. I kind of have this recurring theme in dreams. You know, I live with Cindy and James, and um, one of my recurring dreams for many years is we're in a situation where I'm trying to find James, get James, rescue James. Somehow we find ourselves in the middle of a flood, and I'm looking for James, and I'm swimming across trying to get him. Recently, because I have an active imagination, apparently, I had a dream that Cindy, James, and I were sitting in this fancy hotel in Manila. It's called the Edsa Shangri-La. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's a five-star hotel. The lobby is three stories high, and the one wall is an entire glass. And outside of the glass is this beautiful, perfectly manicured, tropical garden with a swimming pool. And I'm sitting there with Cindy. All of a sudden in my dream, terrorists repel from the roof. This is, 
This is, you need to pray for your pastor. Terrorists repel from the roof in black suits. They come sliding down the glass and they begin shooting holes in the glass wall and it all shatters. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh boy, everything I've read and everything I know, the people who survive are those who act fast. I need to get Cindy and James. I look around. I see James. He's sort of caught up in the chaos. I'm running through the crowd trying to grab James so I can get out. I don't know what I was thinking about Cindy, okay? Those are the dreams. I'm just glad to wake up. I've actually gone into the next room to just make sure. Oh, there he is. He's, he's asleep. All is well. Go back to sleep. Which reminds me, now that Cindy is here and I've confessed my dream she's not heard of. <clears throat> Cindy, I really would rescue you. <laughs> when we were, we were young and only had two kids and expecting our third, which turned out to be Robert, um, Cindy was... Um, I have to be real careful here. She was great with child. Is that acceptable? Okay. Because you never want to refer to size when it comes to your pregnant wife, men in the room, you know that. So she was great with child. And we had just put the two little girls down. And Cindy came in and she, she's ready for a nap because, you know, when you're that pregnant, you're always ready for a nap. So I've been told. So I decided I'd, I'll lay down with her. So we, we all laid down, and all of a sudden, the room started shaking. I'm like, what? Am I, am I imagining something? I looked up, looked around. No, no, the room was shaking. I'm rifling through the database of my mind. Oh, my goodness. I think this is an earthquake. This is not a small tremor. This is a real full-blown earthquake. What did my dad tell me to do in an earthquake? This is the conversation I'm having with, my, with myself in split-second time. I mean, it's, it's quick. And... My dad always says, if there's an earthquake, get out of the building because it might crumble. If it's not structurally sound, it'll crumble all over you. You're better off outside. So as I'm going through this in my mind and the room is shaking, I jump out of the bed. I run across the hall, scoop up both of my little girls. I run down the stairs and out the front of our townhouse into the area that is just grass and and, I, and I'm holding on to them, and I'm looking around, waiting to see what's going to fall first. All of a sudden, Cindy comes walking out of the house, and she looks at me. She says, so you're not going to say anything to me? You're just leaving? Apparently, that's a recurring theme. I will rescue you. Dreams can unsettle you. And I'm telling you what, this dream unsettled the king. I, I would imagine that he woke these wise men up in the middle of the night. He wakes up, he says to his attendants, go get the wise men, I want to talk to them now. But your honor, you, your excellency, or whatever they call the king of Babylon, um, it's three o'clock in the morning. I don't care what time it is. Go get those wise men. I need to talk to them now. So sleepy-eyed, woken up, wise men enter into the king's uh, palace. And he says, listen, I've had a dream. I want you to tell me what the dream was. And I want you to tell me what the dream meant. He's riding on his bicycle with his eyes closed. And he has got to find out what's going to happen in the future according to this dream. Second point of the story, the second chapter of the story is Daniel's rude awakening. Verse 12, for this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So if you can imagine, he's like 17, 18 years old, the knock comes at the door and he says, yes, come with me, we're going to kill you. What? Are you kidding me? And then Daniel, um, he immediately goes into the third most important point here, and that is that he pulls together a prayer team. Verse 14, when the counsel and the wisdom of Daniel, then with the counsel and wisdom 
Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had got, gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house. He made the decision known to Han Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel pulls together a prayer team in this time of crisis. You know what God loves? He loves authentic earnest, surrendered, surrendered, humble prayers. There's a lot in the Bible about prayers. There's some passages that talk about why God doesn't like about prayers. Isaiah chapter one, he told the people, I hate your solemn assemblies. I hate your sacrifices. You're going through the routine of worship, but your hearts really aren't seeking me. Matthew Jesus tells how to pray. And, and Jesus says, you know, what, what is not needed is vain repetition or long prayers. You're not looking for a formula of prayer that can force God to do what you want him to do. Here the whole idea of prayer is to fall before your God, humbled, surrendered, and trusting and asking God. That's what this is about. Prayer is a great theme throughout the book of Daniel. There is a God in heaven who knows all things, who has all power and ability to guide, to direct, and to help. While you're traveling down that country road with your eyes closed, there is a God who knows what's ahead. And he's made himself available to be a part of your life and to show you what to do. He's just waiting for you to ask. When I was young, I memorized the verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I love this verse. It continues to be one of my favorite. Listen to it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. I pull that verse out regularly. When I'm sad and afraid, when I have a problem, when I don't know what to do, when I'm struggling in a confusing relationship situation, oh, believe me, I'm good at blowing stuff up. Anybody here good at that? I, I've learned I gotta, I gotta be quiet and get on my knees and I say to God, God, I trust you with all my heart. When I actually do believe, God, that you are there and that you are good and you are trustworthy and, man, you are so generous to me and your mercies are renewed every day uh, and your love is never gonna end and I trust you, oh God, with all my heart. And right now, I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. Lord, I've got a speech prepared I want to go and deliver to somebody, but I'm not going to do that. I'm acknowledging I need your help in this situation. So would you please guide me? I think one of the most awesome things about God is that he wants to be involved in our lives and he is big enough and powerful enough and wise enough, transcendent in his being so that he can have an individual personal conversation with every single person on the planet who calls up to him and knows with great detail what's going on in our lives and he knows what's around the bend and he knows when that farmer's gonna pull out with a wagon and he will say, now that you've asked, 
I'm going to show you what to do. I love that verse. You know, the Lord sometimes, when I pray that verse, says that you need to back up a little bit. You're just a little bit hot. Does God ever tell you that? You probably don't know everything. You might need to ask more questions rather than make more accusations. Silence and timing are beautiful tools. Put one foot in front of the other and keep on going and don't give up. I might just be telling you what God tells me sometimes. This is what it, I mean, you know, Daniel, they could have all gone crazy and freaked out and been mad. And Daniel says, hey, King, give me time. Buddies, I'm calling an emergency prayer meeting. Can you get on your knees with me? And let's pray and seek the Lord of heaven. Let's beg for his mercies and his intervention. This is the invitation of God. Jesus said in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what in the New Testament it says, where two or three are gathered, when you pray in agreement, that means you all come together and pray about a particular issue that's going on. That there, something happens that is bigger than just you alone. And you know what? You guys are in church. We're all in church today. If there's something going on in your life that makes you afraid or scared, you're not sure what to do about, you know what you need to do? Why in the world would you not grab a couple buddies and have a prayer meeting this morning? After this service, you can come down here and pray. The hallways are open for prayer. You, what, pray in church? Who thought of that, right? But I think it's a thing we ought to do. I think we should do it all the time. Why is it important to pray with other people? Because here's the deal. When you pray with other people, you admit your vulnerability and your weakness. You, you, you admit that you need the backup. It is a humbling experience. And God says, I want to tell you, I will show up. And that way, when you rejoice with the answer, it's not just you who's rejoicing. All three or four or five of you, man, you're going to be celebrating. Hey, God heard and helped. So what do they do? They pray. You know, if we were to do that, here's the deal. I've got my sweet church smile on today. Did you, do you have that too? Sometimes I need to drop the smile and say to some friends around me, I just really need some help. Will you pray with me? I don't have to give them the details. I can just give them the topic. I can just admit. I can just. You know how amazing it is for God's people to put their hand on each other's shoulders and admit their need and ask for God's help. So I hope some of you will grab a companion, pull together a little prayer team, see what God will do. Fourth, the dream is revealed. It's a long passage. I'm going to try to rifle through this in six minutes, okay? So here we go. You may have to do a little homework today. It's Daniel chapter 2. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence 
presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers cannot declare to the king, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and visions of your head upon your bed were there. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. Do you see the humility of Daniel? But for our sakes, who, who, who make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So if you were a captive teenager in Babylon after your country has been destroyed and the temple desecrated, you might be asking, so is God done? Will the testimony, will the presence of God be forever taken away from the peoples of this world? I wonder, has God decided to abandon mankind and to just leave us to ourselves? Or is he still at work? Could he still be at work? And God thrusts Daniel to the center of political and economic power on the earth that day. And he leads him to declare to the king who is most powerful, there is a God in heaven. He is a revealer of the mysteries. And this God has got something to say to you, Nebuchadnezzar. You see, God wasn't done. He didn't end the story. Praise, aren't you glad? Um, he goes on to describe the, the vision, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shortcut this. Here we go. Y you saw a great image. The splendor was excellent. And this image had a head of fine gold chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone that was, not, that was cut without hands, it wasn't a quarried stone, it came out of nowhere, humans didn't make this, this stone came, struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. The iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. This is the dream. Now we, will, now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and whatever the children of men, wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. That's a good start, don't you think? Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, okay, I'm not feeling so bad all of a sudden. But after you will rise another kingdom inferior to yours and another and a third one of bronze, which shall rule all over the earth. <clears throat> you can read the rest of the chapter, but here's, here's basically what it is. The head of gold, the, he, this is the prophecy of the history of the world. The head of gold is the Chaldean Empire. The silver uh, it, it, a chest and arms are the Medes and the Persians. The bronze is the Grecian Empire, and iron is the empire of Rome, and the iron and clay are when Rome starts to fall apart, and there's sort of like a, there's, you know, there's some coalitions going on, but it wasn't ever as strong as before. And then out of the blue, this rock comes tumbling down and 
crushes the statue and becomes a great mountain. And this is the kingdom that will have no end and will last forever. I want to tell you something. We are headed to this kingdom. Do you ever feel like as a Christian that you're kind of in the minority and nobody cares about what you have to say and it doesn't matter anymore and it doesn't matter because the kingdom of Jesus, what was he called? Of his kingdom, it shall never end. He's the prince of peace. He, his kingdom is never going to end. It tells the history of the world right there. You study world history, there you go. Chaldeans, the Medes, the Persians, Greek, Greece, um, Rome. Rome is in charge when Jesus comes and is crucified on the cross. He hangs there on the cross bearing the sin of the world, shedding his blood, and when it's done, he cries out, it is finished, bam, the earth quakes, uh, the temple veil is rent in two, a new kingdom has begun, it's the kingdom of Jesus, and all who put their faith and trust in him, they are part of this kingdom, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Some concluding thoughts. First is this, God is the God who is all powerful and controls all things. And Daniel and his buddy so needed to hear this. Nebuchadnezzar seemed firmly in control of all things. But then God steps up and thrusts the testimony and even the prophetic word of how the world will go and declares, actually, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Secondly, Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. Kind of good news and bad news for the king here because you know, you know what the right thing that you're supposed to say to a monarch is? O king, live forever, right? Have you ever heard that? All right. Um, actually, that can never happen, right? They're, they're lying to the monarch because you can't live forever. Daniel reminds great King Nebuchadnezzar, yeah, you're the, you're the greatest, but your time's coming up. Nobody lives forever. None of us are going to live forever. One of my favorite stories about death, I guess if you're a preacher, you can have those stories, right? That's, my favorite story is this. Two guys love baseball so much, played baseball together their whole life. Part of the discussions on a regular basis was this. Hey, do you think there's baseball in heaven? And they went back and forth about whether or not there would be baseball in heaven, and then one of them died. A few years later, the one guy who had died came back and says to his buddy, hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. First of all, good news is there is baseball in heaven. Bad news is you're pitching Friday. The greatest, richest, most powerful, most influential person alive on the planet today is eventually going to die. Life is a vapor. You know, that's why Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, because that's what we don't want to do, but have everlasting life. That's what we want to have. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what we need. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment, Scripture says. Nebuchadnezzar, as powerful as he was, 
would be subject to the brevity of life like every other person who's ever lived. Timothy Keller writes about the power of the resurrection. He says that a minister was in Italy when he saw a grave of a man who had died centuries before. He was an unbeliever and completely against Christianity, but at the same time a little afraid of it too. So the man had a huge slab stone put over his grave so that he would not be raised from the dead in case there was a resurrection from the dead. And he had uh, insignias put all over the slab saying, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I do not believe in it. Uh, Evidently, when he was buried, an acorn must have fallen into the grave because a hundred years later, this acorn had already grown uh, up and had split the slab and all of the writings this guy had put on it and now stood high above them. And if an acorn has that much power in its biological life to split a slab of that magnitude, what can the acorn of God's resurrection power do do in a person's life? The moment you decide to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your life. It's the power of the resurrection. The same thing that raised Jesus from the dead. Think of all the things you see as immovable slabs in your life. Your bitterness, your insecurity, your fears, your self-doubts. Those things can be split and rolled off. The more you know him, the more you grow into the power of the resurrection. Jesus is real. His salvation is powerful. He amazingly enough is a God who in spite of our sin, he wants to save us and he paid for us. And he wants to be involved in our lives. So we no longer have to be the person on the bicycle headed down the country roads, the hills and the valleys and the curves and waiting for the farmer with his his, uh, trailer coming out in front of us or the cow that might get loose and run with our eyes closed. You know what God says, that's no way to live. Here's the deal. Why don't you, even though you don't know the future, stay in close contact with me because I do. And you can trust in me. And I'll show you what to do. And I will give you a resurrection so that you will never perish. My story didn't end at the destruction of Jerusalem. I carried it forward into Babylon. The question today is, will you ask for God's help? Will you surrender to him and make him your Lord and Savior? Whatever your trouble is right now, will you reach out to him and ask for his help and wisdom? He's ready. He's waiting. Did anybody here happen to read about the pilot in a private aircraft in Florida, mid-flight, that became incapacitated and incoherent and left only passengers with no flight experience on the plane. Did you hear about that? So the one passenger goes to the cockpit, radios the ground and says, listen, the pilot, the only one who can fly this plane, I mean, he's out. Nobody knows what to do. And the guy on the ground says, hey, I'll tell you what to do. Okay, what I want you to do is is I want you to keep the wings straight, keep them level. I want you to start pushing so that you begin to descend very slowly. Fly the coast, either north or south, doesn't matter. That way we can find you and we will guide you. I'm not making this story up. This passenger on a private jet, was led by the guy on the ground and instructed, and he landed the plane safely. 
And his final question was, how do I turn this thing off? God says, hey, listen, y'all don't know the future. But I do. I love you. I care about you. I'll talk you through it all. Will you just call upon me? I want to ask you to bow your heads if you would please right now. I don't know what's going on in your heart. I do want to ask this question. Have you ever, as we heard so beautifully the testimonies of those who were baptized, have you ever made Jesus your Lord and Savior? Have you ever admitted your sin to a holy God? And would you accept Jesus? Would you believe in him? Because he will forgive you. He will save you. But you have to make him your Lord. Don't twist his arm. Don't try to manipulate God with those kind of prayers. With great surrender, say, God, I'm yours. I will do whatever you say. I will not lean to my own understanding. I'm going to trust you and your goodness and your ways. And I'm asking for you to save me and help me. If you're here and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, would you let me guide you to it through a prayer? Just pray with me. Whether you're online or in the room, say, Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner. I'm afraid to die. I don't want to be condemned for all of eternity. But right now, in this prayer, at this moment, Jesus, I believe in you, the Son of God, the Savior of the world who went to a cross and paid for our sin. And I'm asking you to save me. I want you in my life. I want to follow you. I want to listen to you. So today I ask you to save me. Some of you have stuff going on in your life right now. It's scaring you to death. You don't know what to do. Why don't you just ask him for help? Maybe during our invitation time, grab a buddy or two and say, listen, I really got something I need someone to pray with me about. Why don't don't we turn this place into a house of prayer? or maybe on your way out, or however you want to do it. You and I were never meant to go through life without the help of God and the help of each other. So where you are right now, would you at least speak the word to the Lord and tell him the issue that's on your heart and ask for his help. And I invite you all to stand. Dear God in heaven, thank you for your goodness to us, man. What a wonderful God you are that you, like you don't just put up with us, you actually love us. You seek to guide and direct us and we know that your ways are good and we can truly trust you because no one loves us so much as to die for us. When we think about death, we have a savior who said, I'll die first and I'll show you the way. Thank you, Jesus for the concerns and the struggles and the problems that exist in this room as we lift up our prayers to you we ask you oh God to come and show us the way and we ask this in your son's name amen if you're here and we could pray with you come on we got a prayer team down here just step on out you don't have to tell us the details just say I need help let's pray won't you come